Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to the Radiance podcast from the Japanese Academy. This program's focus is going to be on the month of Ramadan Kareem. Many of us globally are still facing restrictions within the COVID pandemic, and as such, our mosques remain closed. And with that, we are missing out on the community connectedness and the spiritual energy that some of these programs bring. So for the next hour, we're going to talk about how we can create some of that within our homes. Our houses will become the Husseinia, and our community members will be our family. With a little bit of thought and a little bit of planning, we can create this month of Ramadan with some creativity and have uh, an, an, an enhanced um, uh, situation with our children in our homes where we can observe practices and observations that will enable them to feel the spiritual connectedness that we would do as usual if we were attending the mosque. To aid us along the way, our guest this evening comes with a plethora of ideas and suggestions as well as overall guidance on how we can observe the blessed month within our homes. It's an honor to introduce Sheikh Os Asfar. After graduating from McGill University in Canada, he started a successful strategic branding business after which he established the media department for the liaison office of Grand Ayatollah Sistani in the US, as well as establishing the first online on-demand Shia TV station called Ascent TV. He then moved on to fulfill his lifelong dream of becoming a student at the Islamic seminary Hoza in the holy city of Najaf, where he studied advanced level studies under some of our great Maraja. At present, he's currently attending classes of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sistani and Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Rida al-Sistani. In parallel to his Hoza studies, he established the Knowledge Seekers five-year program where um, it focuses on Islamic education and youth development for youth groups in the US and Canada. He is also the founding member of Al Ain in North America, as well as one of the trustees of Al Ain Foundation Canada. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh, and a very warm welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to thank you for extending the invitation to me to come and be part of your uh, Radiant podcast or Radiance podcast, I should say. Uh, it's a, an honor to be with you, inshallah. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to serve as much as we can. Inshallah, Allah, yameen. Thank you so much. Um, so, Sheikh, before we go into the specifics of some of the things that we can do within our homes, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could set the scene and perhaps highlight a little bit of the significance of this holy month of Mahi Ramadan and why we pay, like pay particular attention to it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Habib ilah al-Alameen, Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad wa ala Ali Bayti al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني أفقه قولي الله سبحانه وتعالى states in the Holy Quran he says شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this beautiful month of Ramadan he says it is the month in which Allah revealed the Holy Quran so this is the most important part of its significance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the entirety of the Holy Quran uh, to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Um, why as a guidance Allah says, hudan lin nasi for people, in general people, not just Muslims, for people. Wa bayinatin min al huda wal furqan. And bayinat is a beautiful word that means a clarification. When we say something is bayin, which means that something is clear. Bayinat is the plural of bayin, which means that, a, that this book is a clarifier for all things in reality. It allows us to see things with clarity. Now, uh, subhanAllah that this uh, Holy Quran was revealed in this beautiful month in which our breath in it is considered a form of ibadah, um, our sleep in it is considered uh, accepted deeds, as Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us in the welcoming of the month of uh, Ramadan in the last Friday 
uh, in the sermon that he gave in welcoming the month of Ramadan at the end of the holy month of Shaban, where one of the things that he said um, is the fact that everything in this month that we do is accepted. All of our dhunub are maghfura. All of our sins are um, uh, forgiven in this holy month. So there's a great deal of si significance. Ashayatin uh, maghlula. Uh, that the uh, um, the satans that the whisperers that come and affect us every single day in the month of Ramadan they will be enchained and the doors of hell will be closed and on the absent end the doors of heaven will be open and the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be upon us where everything that we do even our sleep and our breath, as I said, is going to be accepted. And every deed, sometimes we go through, you know, our daily lives and we're unsure whether our deeds will be accepted or not. But in the month of Ramadan, our deeds will be accepted. So Allah makes it easy for us. It's a month of reformatting our hard drives, right? Reformatting, getting our oil lube and filter, so to speak. Right? We need it. We need to be able to recharge. Allah gives us a, a spiritual recharging where he basically um, says, you know what? This is your reset one. Allah resets for us. Uh, when we come out of the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. we come out completely absolved of all of our mm -hmm. sins. Mm -hmm. As long as our goal was to please Allah, to fast the month exactly as He wants uh, from us to do. And that's why He says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ And as for those of you who witnessed the holy month, therefore you must fast it. When Imam Ali عليه, asked the Holy Prophet, what's the best thing we can do in this month? He said, He said, be precautious that you do not fall into the prohibitions of Allah. Everything else will be taken care of for you. Inshallah. So, you know, Sheikh, you mentioned some beautiful words of our Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There is also, we have heard of a hadith where he says that this is the month in which you have been invited to yes. the banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Please, Sheikh, can you elaborate a little bit of what, on what that means? Of course. Um, this, again, is from the sermon of the Holy Prophet and that he gave, he delivered on the last Friday of Sha'ban in welcoming the holy month of Ramadan. And the goal was for the Prophet to tell us, and, and he uses a really beautiful metaphor, where he, he wants us to imagine as though we are being hosted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in reality, mm -hmm what's happening and we know that when we host guests ourselves what do we do we bring out our best dinnerware we make sure that our house is nice and clean we make sure that we are serving our guests right so we say to Absolutely. our guests Le -baik, which means i'm at your service and so what the prophet is telling us here is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is treating us the same way but remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlimited in his generosity he's unlimited in his graciousness He's unlimited, period, in everything that he does. And so he's going to be the most gracious to us in this holy month. And he will say to us, abdi, I'm here to serve you, my creation, or my worship. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So, you know, you mentioned the etiquette of the host. And if we were in the, um, the role of the host, we would welcome somebody and we would treat them with honor and respect and offer them food and drink. So in this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our host and we are his guest. Now, is there any etiquette in the role of the guest that we must be mindful of and we must think about fulfilling, especially as we're guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course. There's no other month that um, you could probably say where we are more God-weary, God-conscious mm -hmm. than the month of Ramadan. Would you agree? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. We are conscious of what we say, we're conscious of what we look at, we're conscious of what we hear. And no other month are we like that. You know, it is, it, and, and specifically, I always ask the youth, I say, when do you find yourself mo most God conscious? Nine times out of 10, they actually say um, either, uh, you know, when I'm fasting or if I've gone through some sort of calamity where I remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm. Subhanallah, right? So fasting then, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the chapter of Al-Baqarah, he says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ in verse 45. وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ So he says, and seek refuge and help in patience and in prayer. 
And surely it is a great undertaking, except for those who are God conscious. When Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq was asked about the meaning of that verse, he said, he said, a sabr here, patience here is fasting. Mm -hmm. So the question is, well, how can I be of the God conscious? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in verse 46 right after uh, in the chapter of Baqarah, the very same chapter. He says, Those are the ones that believe that they will meet their Lord and that to he they shall return. So in order to be in a state of consciousness, you have to have that belief in your mind that I am from Allah and that to he I shall return, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the state we're in when we're in fasting. We're in that state where we're aware of Allah. We know it's not just simple awareness where, oh, may, perhaps, maybe, no. It's, you know, when I say something that I'm not supposed to say, I say, Allahumma inni sa'im, oh Allah, I'm fasting. Right. When somebody says something to me where normally I may be intolerant, I remind myself, I say, Allahumma inni sa'im, I have this conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Oh Allah, I am fasting. As though I'm saying to Allah that I'm attentive to, to right. what you want of me. I know that you mm -hmm. see me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, <clears throat> let's, let's elaborate a little bit more on the role of ourselves as a guest mm -hmm. and let's do this analogy that for example if we were a guest in our general life and we were invited somewhere the few days preceding that program we would do some kind of preparation whether it be finding out the location of the program any things that we need to bring to the event we would make things ready and in order before the day of the event approaches sure. now let's shift this mindset to the holy month of ramadan we are going to be a guest as the month approaches and the days preceding it. What kind of preparations do we do in order for us to uh, be at the doorstep of that event before it actually happens? So we are going to be a guest. We know it's coming and we have a few days of preparation. What are the some of the kinds of things that we have to do to ourselves and our minds to, to receive that month? Well, we actually have not just more than a few days of preparation. We have the month of Rajab, Rajab mm -hmm. al and we have the month of Sha'ban to prepare for that one month. Well, that's when we start getting into the zone of God consciousness. That's when we start becoming aware. And subhanAllah, the events in those months, when we do Ihya of certain events, whether it's the middle of every month, uh, the middle days of every month, fasting them, or fasting the first third day, first Thursday, last Thursday, middle, middle Wednesday, or doing the dua of Rajab, or doing, subhanAllah, the dua of Rajab that we recite after every salah, or the duas that we recite after every salah in Sha'ban, or in Munajat al-Sha'baniya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allahi alayhi, the whispered prayer of supplication of al-Imam, uh, salam Allahi alayhi. Uh, the 15th of Sha'ban, our connectedness, that, that ability to connect with al-Imam al-Hujjah, ajallah ta'ala faraja, the birth of al-Imam al-Husayn, salam Allahi alayhi, the uh, birth of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah. So many events occurring in Rajab and Sha'ban that are blessed events, events that are happy events, glorious events, that allow us to be reminded in such a, a huge kind of, um, say, um, saturation of, of events occurring within a period of two months. It is very hard for us not to be prepared and to come into the state of say, you know, I'm here, I'm receiving this month, thinking about Imam al-Hujjah, Sahib al-Asri wa zaman I'm receiving this month, thinking about the wisdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi. I'm receiving this month, even recalling the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein, because, you know, we can't not recall the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein mm -hmm. and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, who were born, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, uh, in the beginning of, of the holy month, or even the Il Imam Al Baqir, salam Allah alayhi, you know, in his birth during during uh, during the month uh, of uh, of Rajab, right? All of these events occurring puts us in the mindset of God consciousness, brings us closer to Ahl al Bayt, allows us to connect with the uh, Dua. Maybe not necessarily the Holy Quran if we're not aware, right? But then all of a sudden, what happens? 
the the month of Ramadan. This month is the month of the Holy Quran. And so it's exactly like, um, you know, if you want to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is telling us, understand my representatives. If you want to know how to treat my words of the Holy Quran, then remember what etiquettes were followed by the imams whom I placed on this earth for you to learn the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That it is in the Messenger of Allah, I placed for you a great exemplar, right? And so, when the Prophet says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say that I ask you for no reward, except that you show mawadda. This is a beautiful word. It's translated in some books as love. But um, it's not just love. It's kindness and care and allegiance and loyalty. So many meanings in the word wood and mawadda. Um, for those who know Arabic morphology, the meme is meme masdariya. It brings me back to the source of that kindness and care and love. The wow has a mawadda, um, the dal afwan has a shadda on it in, in, in the form of mufa'al, which means that you actively you know, are are taking on that role of showing kindness. It's not a passive act by any by any means at all, right? And mm. that month is helping us do that, those two months of Rajab and Sha'ban. So when I come to the month of Ramadan and I'm being hosted by Allah, I'm bringing with me these beautiful gifts. When I go to my friend's house, I bring gifts, right, to the house mm. of me. Mm. It's part of the etiquettes where I might bring some baklava or I might bring some sweets, some shirini, or I might bring some um, halim, for example, depending on which culture you're from. Yeah. Right? And you that would be, be received very well. <laughs> right? Except our sweet here is our appreciation of Ahlul Bayt and yes. our understanding of their value and, mm. and the fact that they are the exemplars and the examples for us. So I see what they did during the month of, of Ramadan. I see how they approach the month of Ramadan. I, mm. I, act, I act with the month of Ramadan just as I would act if I was visiting Imam Hussein, salam Allah alayhi. Think about it. When you go yeah. visit Imam Hussein, when you go visit Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi, right? You feel like you're undergoing this great hajj, right? And you know that when you go there, if you go to the Imam Arifan Bihaqqa, knowing his right upon yes. you, then your ziyara will be accepted. So how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing me to know the Holy Quran through the second weight of the two weighty things that Prophet Muhammad left us, right? I am leaving with you two weighty things. If you grab onto them, hang onto them tightly, then you will not deviate after me, right? And so... Mm. Obviously, if I grab onto them, right? And we say in the Hawza, bishartiha wa shurutiha, with its conditions. You take the Holy Quran, you take it with its conditions. They are part of that condition, right? That in Ghadir Khum, when the Holy Prophet announced um, that there are two weighty things that I'm leaving behind uh, Kitabullah, the Book of Allah, wa itrati ahl bayti, and my uh, progeny, my ahl al bayt, ma intamasaktum bihima, if you grab onto them, tightly you will not ever ever go astray after me so when i grab on to them first and they guide me to the month of ramadan and they say here allah receive them it's exactly like subhanallah i'm reminded by the verse in the holy quran in the chapter of al-layl where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya Oh, nafs that has been um, become content, return to your Lord. Radia, which means that you've become pleased. Mardiya, Allah is pleasing you, that you will be also made pleased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will ensure that you are pleased. And then what does it say? It says, It says, and then who will come and receive you, the Ahlul Bayt? So Quran is guiding you to Ahlul Bayt. And Allah is telling you, grab on to Ahlul Bayt to be guided to the Holy Quran, right? Mm -hmm. So I come to the holy month of Ramadan. Part of the et etiquettes then becomes that I bring with me, you know, 
um, the Imams that I follow on the day that everyone will be called by their leader, their Imam at the end of time, then when I approach the month of Ramadan, who I do, who do I bring with me, right? I bring someone who is closest to Allah, closest to his words. And that's the connection I have with Ahlul Bayt, the infallible Imams Ali Afdal Salat Wasallam. And what a beautiful and what beautiful halim and what beautiful gift to actually bring. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. You know, I think I think um, mashallah, that was very, very eloquently put. And definitely the way you explained it, it's put so much enhancement on the spiritual side of it and the significance of the months, like you said, of Rajab and Shaban. Now, when we're approaching Ramadan and we come with that readiness, mm -hmm. now the little bit of a twist that we have to add to this one perhaps for the majority of us globally across the world, is that we're going to be opening the doors of the Husseiniyah, which are our houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on a practical aspect, now as a family unit, what are some of the things that we can now put into place in a practical way as we open our homes to this and welcome this month in our homes now this time? I think, subhanAllah, with the, obviously the pandemic, I'm sure everybody's sick about hearing about the pandemic. <laughs> mm. But with, with the advent of this great trial and tribulation that Allah has bestowed upon the world, um, no time have, have I, I would say, the, at no other time has the collective human intellect connected with um, a greater power than in our time, I would say, collectively as a humanity. Everybody... Mm -hmm trying to find purpose in their life because they were thwarted into asking the question of if I step out the door, am I going to live or not? Am I going to be able to eat today or not? Am I going to be able to feed my children or not? Mm -hmm. right? I remember the last month of Ramadan, this was a big issue. We were talking about, I remember giving lectures about how the NBA themselves dealt with the issue of great calamities, the du'as. I took every single situation that each of the prophets, um, so, such as Prophet Yunus, for example, when he was in the belly of the whale, or Prophet Ayyub, alayhi salam, um, you know, when he was struck by leprosy, or Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, um, when he was exiled, or each one of our uh, prophets actually went through a great time of trial and tribulation. And they use specific du'as to be able to 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 uh, to make it through, right? Mm -hmm. The important thing that's important to notice here is the fact that in every single instance, in every single case, they were in a state of solitude. Okay. Think about it. They were mm -hmm. all in a state of solitude. And I have a lecture I gave last year about this state of solitude, how important it is. Now, if you really think about it, we're we're not maybe in the same state of mind that we might have been last year when the pandemic first hit. But now we're a little more settled in, and you know we're we've given a sense of normalcy to the state that yeah. we're of the pandemic, right? We're not. You know, I would say the divorce rates have stabilized a little, <laughs> right? And the problems between the parents and the, the children have cooled down a little, right? They're a little more manageable. So it's not as hectic, perhaps, this month of Ramadan as it may have been last month of Ramadan. Last month of Ramadan, it was just praying that, you know... Um, yeah, from one day to the next. Yeah, from one day to the next, right? Yeah. Yeah. making sure that if we have any prayers that we didn't do that we're making them up if we we make amends with anybody who you know maybe we wronged um or spoke about in backbiting mm -hmm. or or mm -hmm. if we lied la samahallah or if we have debts you know, every one of us sat down and made our made their will we started yeah. becoming more aware of our religion and we started becoming more aware of the importance of spending time with our kids alhamdulillah it's true yeah. So, you know, you know, spending time with your children, this is, I think, one of the blessings in, in, in that we realized over the course of the past year, because time itself is, is such a blessing. And when you're able to do it with people that you care for and love and, you know, you're nurturing that relationship with your child, it's so, so important. So 
now that we're on our second year um, uh, of this, uh, and we're we're going to be approaching this month in our second year and our second time, and we don't have that beautiful atmosphere of the mosque or the Husseinia. And we want to create that in our house. So what are some of the things within our homes that as a family we can do? So you know the atmosphere is lightened in our home and the children, young and old, without having to um, be told so much, the whole essence of the whole month of Ramadan is around them because mm -hmm. of, of what we can create within our homes. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Obviously, setting the scene becomes very important. Mm -hmm. Telling them the importance of the month before it actually comes through our actions, not even necessarily through our words, through recounting memories of the past Ramadans that I had when I was a child with my parents, my grandparents. Sharing those stories is a, is very important to the identity of our children, right? Now, maybe some of us, we didn't have spiritual months of Ramadan. Maybe we weren't as religious, for example, at one time in our lives. Maybe our parents weren't that religious and we became more religious as time went by and we learned more. So there's a lesson to be learned there to be able to teach our children, right? I'm giving them something that they didn't have. Or if I did experience um, a beautiful Ramadan before and I had I came from a religious family, then I want to be able to obviously give them the same sort of memories. And it's the creation of the memories that's extremely important. Mm. And how okay. I can do that, is through my actions. For example, um, I would tell my children, I did that today. I said, okay, you know, where's the house decoration committee? Let's have a meeting, right? And uh, <laughs> let's figure out who's going to take care of the lights, who's going to take care of the other decorations, who's going to take it, and who's prepped for, you know, uh, the nights of Qadr, who's going to take care of of that stuff, who's going to take care of the banners we're going to put up for the martyrdom of, of Amir al Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi, who's going to take care of uh, the uh, who's the dua committee, who's the adhan committee, who's the making them feel as though they have a role to play and them taking ownership. It, it, okay. subhanallah, one of the benefits of the month of being at home with them is that we can actually have something similar to creating a program for ourselves. Right, but um, and, and that in itself creates an ambiance, an atmosphere. Having Quran play in the house, right, is part of the atmosphere. Having du'a in the house, always playing, is part of the atmosphere. What I like to do is I always like to. If you go to the um, to, for example, the uh, website of the Holy Shrine of Amir al-Mu'minin, salam Allah alayhi, or of uh, the Shrine of Al Imam al Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, or of al kalamain you can actually see inside the shrine and you can see the visitors of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, yeah. of al Abbas, of Amir al Mu'mineen, of al Imam al Kadhim, al Imam al Jawad, of al Imam al Hadi, and al Imam al Hassan al Askari. You can see people coming in and out and just connecting with, with them like that, being feeling as creating that ambiance and atmosphere of spirituality, right? can be done using modern forms of media that are available to mm -hmm. us using it in a positive mm -hmm. way and then giving you know your your children tasks and assigning yourself to, you know not sitting on the couch and saying hey you go do this and you go do that that's not what we're talking about right no but being part of it being part of creating that memory being part of that mm -hmm. shared time that we're that we're having with them that time that we won't ever get back i'm reminded by the story that happened in the month of Muharram. Uh, one of the brothers who's a beautiful reciter in Niagara Falls, mashallah, uh, he has a beautiful voice. Um, he usually also is the caretaker for the mosque there and the Islamic school, the full-time Islamic school that, school that they have there. He also runs the programs and he got together the youth to create the programs in the mosque. Now, I remember I told him, you know, since you're under quarantine, everything has to be closed down. You're the only person that can go, you know, to the center. Maybe do Ziyarat Ashura there because every day they would mm -hmm. do Ziyarat Ashura. So I said, I said to him, what do you think? He said, Sheikh, that's a great idea. But honestly, this is the first month of Muharram, the first time I've ever spent the entire time with my children. And we're sitting mm -hmm. as together, enjoying the time. Sometimes, you know, assigning tasks, is a good thing 
But sometimes realize mm -hmm. that just taking it all in, being together, sharing that time of God consciousness, sharing those simple stories, right? Praying jama'ah together, right? Taking the opportunity to pray jama'ah together, right? Assigning if you don't have a place in your home where that's your musalla, the place where you pray, assigning a place for you to pray in congregation, right? Um, sitting down and maybe every day explaining to them one verse of the Holy Quran, one verse. Uh, Prophet, the Prophet sallallahu is reported to have said, There is no good in reciting without understanding, right? Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi he says that one should not recite the Holy Quran looking towards the end of the verse, meaning mm. to trying to finish. Right? Yes. One yes. should focus on understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, do they not take the time to understand the words of the Holy Quran or are there locks on their hearts? Now we know in the month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, the locks are removed. So this is a great opportunity to just, you know, take certain concepts of the Holy Quran, even if it's the short surahs, and just focus on one verse or one idea or one concept. That's one. Two, so afwan, let's start from the beginning. Atmosphere. Ambiance, right? Through mm -hmm. action, through action, not just words. Words, sharing memories of the past, right? Three, spending time with your kids, just taking it all in. Four, trying to understand the words of the Holy Quran, right? Taking one concept, one verse, but really focusing on trying to understand it. Five, mm -hmm. do like that brother, may Allah bless him, this wonderful Qara, who said, we just sit and we would just sit and watch your lectures together. Right, choosing a lecturer or speaker where you would get together as a family and watch that person giving that talk together. That way, you have mm -hmm. another shared experience, right? And then, mm -hmm. lastly, I spoke about the issue of solitude. It's important. One of our great scholars of our time, his name is Sayyid Munir al Khabbaz, Ayatollah Sayyid Munir al Khabbaz, one of the students of Grand Ayatollah Khoui one of the students of Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani, one of the students of Grand Ayatollah Mirza Jawad al-Tabrizi. Um, he's a very, very uh, respected um, mujtahid. He is a jurist. He is a mujtahid. He teaches Bahth Kharaj and Qom. He studied in Najaf for many years. Now he teaches in Qom. He said, make sure that when you pray, if that you do the mustahabbat, the recommended prayers or recommended acts, in front of your kids hmm. in front of your kids so if you're going to pray salat al-layl you might want to do it in solitude yes but even if they're sleeping put your sujada your janamas in front of their bed next to their bed and mm -hmm. pray in front of them if they open their eyes even if they peek as they hear you murmuring in dua or in salah or seeing you in prostration it will forever be imprinted in their mind and in their memory. Mm. There is no greater memory than that. And I'll tell you a, a really beautiful story uh, about this issue. A, a brother, I remember uh, from Kuwait, really beautiful brother, mashallah, very, very pious, great level of Iman. He was studying in Michigan. I'm here in Michigan now. I came two days ago from the holy city of Najaf. And um, I, I'm reminded by him because his mother his mother was sick. And I remember he said to me one day, he said, you know, Sheikhna, when I would sleep, I would open up my eyes to see my mother praying Salat al-Layl every night. She would never miss her. I would see her crying, the tears coming down her face as she raised her hands to the sky, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, that he takes care of us and he takes care of of my father and that she and you know that that really struck home with me because what memory am i leaving for my children will it be that type of memory where my child will remember me for that moment and that instant or not and that's what we should really ask ourselves as parents and this is a great opportunity to start in the holy month of Ramadan. You know, you mentioned some really valid points about the role of the parent. 
um, in teaching their child, and also um, media. So, for example, this past year, there's been such a huge influx of availability of online programs for children. And alhamdulillah, a lot of talent and creativity has come through from various organizations and even individuals putting together programs for children. And because it's on an online platform, the world is so much more accessible. You can probably access any hour and any time zone, and you'll probably be able to find something online for your child. Now, what are your thoughts about um, the utilizing some of these online programs in the month of Ramadan? Because, you know, some parents, they might feel comfortable having their child partake in these online sessions. They might feel that, you know, there's a level of expertise that the host and the facilitator of the program is able to bring forward and bring through that um, will be beneficial to the child. So by listening to some of your examples of how the role of the parent is so important in in observation, passive observation, what the children can see through actions of the parent, what are your thoughts about... Um, children also partaking in these these online programs in this in this month i think it's a it's a blessing that so many programs have become readily available and i would say hmm. acceptable because i remember before the corona uh pa pandemic i would go to centers and say to them you know let's do a weekly program from najaf and everybody was like but sheikhna people want to be there live they can't connect with broadcasts now everybody comes to you asking for a broadcast you know so it's become more acceptable which is a, mm. a big part of uh, the actual knowledge that you're going to be able to put out there for people to benefit from so acceptability is important but as well oversaturation has become an issue that i've yeah. heard some parents as well as you know mm. so mm. some parents they're like you know it's very tough for for me you know to get them to focus i i really wish that the center would open i know some centers last year they did drive-throughs where they would be in the parking lot and then they would do a big screen outside of the parking lot and that's where they everybody would watch the the lecturer or the chosen lecture yes you know, for yeah. the center. So that's a great idea. If you can participate in that, it's a change of pace, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Create a new memory. I mm -hmm. guarantee that's something that your kids won't forget. But also, mm -hmm. if you are at home, you know, and you can go to your backyard and actually do something like that for yourselves, you know, it's a change as well. You know, sitting on your lawn chairs if you have a if you have a backyard. Or a front yard, even with your neighbors, depending on what neighborhood you're in. If you're mm -hmm. by having mu'minin around you, if not, then in your home, in your living room, make it a routine. Put together a routine for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it's time for namaz, for prayer, right? Make sure that that's the first thing that you do. Break break your fast with a date, right? Number one, start the congregational prayer. After you're done maghrib do a short dua and drink a small bowl of uh, warm soup then do your isha prayer okay i know some of our indo-pak communities they will actually also have their full meal and then after that they will they, they will partake in the isha prayer whatever you choose to do but i think make sure you establish a routine a routine mm -hmm. is very important for children okay mm -hmm. it helps them to organize their time and it helps them not be kind of all over the place. And it makes them understand. I remember, you know, in the last month of Ramadan, when it was time for iftar, my kids would literally make sure that they're rushing to put the, you know, everything on the dining table and the plates and the food, and they're slobbering over the food. And as soon as the iftar happens, you know, <laughs> the Tasmanian devil, you know, taking over, <laughs> right? You know, and, and there is no food, you know, left for me after after salah. <laughs> so I said to them, let's make sure that we don't do ibadah or we do worship of food, right? Remember, fasting is not just fasting from food. Fasting is showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're controlling your desires, right? So if I'm controlling my desires, then no time am I more tested than that time those, that minute, that last minute or two before iftar, right? So 
what I want to make sure of is I want to make sure that they understand that. I'm not saying starve them. No, not at all. Obviously, when they're younger, you know, make sure that you feed them right away. The elderly, make sure that you feed them. Let them, if you have someone who's elder in your home, like a grandmother or a grandfather, right? Make sure that you show them the routine of we feed the Prophet Sallallahu Unfortunately, what happens with us, mm -hmm. culture dictates sometimes, we end up feeding the, the, uh, the adults, the mother, the father, the uncles first, you know, and then we feed the women and the children uh, uh, later. But really what the Prophet Sallallahu his sunnah was actually to feed the elderly and the young and the women first, and then feed the men, right? So if you go for a feast in the month of Ramadan to break your fast, you know, make sure that you tell people about this important sunnah. It's and and include it in the month of Ramadan it becomes a lot more acceptable, even though culturally there may be a stigma. So establish that program then. So um, let them understand that you're fasting from uh, your fasting is a refraining. It's an abstinence. It's your ability to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your ability to tolerate and to be patient. Right. And no time does Allah wants, want to see what you're worshiping than that time of breaking your fast. Some will tell you, well, it's true to make others wait, Sheikhna. Right. I mean, they're at the dining table. Right. So if you feel embarrassed, you know, mm -hmm. at the beginning, let it go. It's fine. You know, sure, break fast with them, but then quickly come back and pray. Next day, introduce the idea. You know, I think I'm going to break my fast on a date. I'll pray and then I'll come and join, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Who wants to pray Jama'ah with me? Right. Yeah. And and so on. Right. Um, so Alhamdulillah, you're introducing positive uh, examples and 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 introducing it in in steps, so they're able to learn and adapt. And you've mentioned some really good ideas to get a routine in place. Um, but what about children who are of different ages? Like, for example, if you have a teenager, mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes they have a little bit more independence and, and their mind is on a different level than the younger child. What if there's a little bit of disinterest, not in a bad way, but there it's the, the, they might not be um, so much more taken into the routine that you want to establish within this household in the month of Ramadan. What, what can you suggest for the teenage years then? Um, it's funny that you mentioned that. I remember the last month of Ramadan, my daughter, who is a teenager, um, I told her, you know, let's do this routine. So she said, Baba, Allah makes sleeping ibadah. Why are you being so tough on us? <laughs> us to do all of this stuff. So I said to her, you know what? You're right. Maybe what I'm telling you to do may be too much. So what we have to do is we have to speak to their intellects, right? So mm -hmm. Imam Ali, he says it beautifully. He says, Haddithun nas ala qadri aqulian. And it's interesting if you read uh, this uh, beautiful book called The Teenage Brain. You'll learn so much about the adolescent and teenage brain if you're interested in learning. You'll find that uh, children, when they're adolescents or teenagers, they're, the gray matter of their of their brain is more well developed, which is the reactive area of their brain, the amygdala. That's why you find that they tend to be uh, in a state of fight or flight. You say something, they might contradict you or they might oppose you. They don't. In actual fact, it's not something that they can control right away unless. Mm -hmm unless you train them to. Their neocortex, which is their, the rational part of the brain, that's still underdeveloped. That doesn't develop, develop really until age 25. It doesn't develop completely be, until between age 25 and 35, okay? So keep that in mind. So when you're talking to your teenager, if they say, well, dad, you know, I'm not into that. You know, I, you know, I think you're being too, too strict or something like that. Don't reject it. Don't reject what they're saying. Try to take it in and understand it and think about their intellect and what they can handle. Mm. And know that when mm. you suggest something automatically, because their amygdala, their flight and flight center is more pronounced and more well-developed than mm. their cortex, the rational part of the brain, then they're not going to be able to rationalize right away. They'll actually think about it after they react. Okay. So you have to stay calm. You know, calm, cool, and collected and contained. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're in the month of Ramadan. And mm -hmm. say to them, okay, that's okay, that's fine. If you want to eat first, that's all right, you know, and, and leave it at that. And then the next time, say something like, well, I'm going to pray. Who wants to pray jama'ah with me? Allah gives us choice. It's a lot more profound if the choice comes from the individual. 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compels us, is that considered to be, um, I mean, does anybody like to, compulsion? Does anybody want to be forced to do anything? No. Would we consider no. forced to do something? All of humanity consider being forced to do something good or bad? Not not good. Not because good we, no, not at all. Not at all. But, but basically, compelling someone is taking away their choice, right? We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlimited, which means he's all perfect, which means he's not going to do anything that's bad at all. Okay. Hasha lillah. You know, Allah would never do uh, something bad. And and not giving us choice. It's considered bad. So that's why he must give us choice to choose him. Right? He says, mm -hmm. Allah even says it. He says, look, I've guided him to the straight path. Now it's up mm -hmm. to him. Either he is shakiran, he's thankful, grateful, follows and stays on that path, or he mm -hmm. hears off and he's disbelieving. Giving them mm -hmm. that choice in the whole month of Ramadan is really important because the choice is easier for them to make because the whispers aren't there controlling them, right? Helping your child to think, um, guiding them in their thought process, being patient in that process is going to help you get the results that you want from your child. And I think um, also, you know, when as adults, um, we have a broader understanding of many things and sometimes we have to be quite careful and put into check that our expectations and our things of ABC of what we want to achieve, we don't necessarily impose them on our child in the full capacity as we feel that we can take on because if you overburden their their, their capacity, they're not gonna benefit, right? Exactly. So exactly. perhaps if we, if we put our suggestions aside, and we allow the older child, like the teenagers, mm -hmm. to suggest a routine. And then we can guide them into the routine of how it will be beneficial for all of the family members. So if they're part of that process mm -hmm. of establishing a routine, that perhaps would also, you know, it, it they won't feel that there's a compulsion there. They themselves are developing the ideas. Santi, perhaps. that's an excellent, excellent suggestion. That's a wonderful suggestion to make them part of the process. Nobody likes mm -hmm. to be dictated to. Making mm -hmm. them part of the process, teaching them how to think and how mm -hmm. to make choices, good choices for themselves, will mm -hmm. allow you to see you know, good things from them. Mm. So, you know, Sheikh, you mentioned really nice things about the general day-to-day -day, um, things that we can do in general. Mm -hmm. But Alhamdulillah, there's some grand nights in the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. the nights of Qadr. And in the years past, when we would attend those nights in the Husseiniyah and in the Imam Barqas, we would have a mindset in place already because we would understand and accept the length of the program. And when you're in the mosque and you're within the congregation, already there's strength there and the atmosphere is there. And you're able to fulfill, you know, the the, the steps of that program with ease. Mm -hmm. Now, now. In this month where we're at home and there's different factors we have to consider, the different age groups of the children, et cetera, and, and what they're able to do and they're able to understand, what are some of the things you can suggest perhaps um, to, uh, as a family, how can we observe those beautiful nights of color within our house? I'm reminded by the narrations that are... Uh are well known about the Sayyidah Zahra salam Allahi alayha, and what she would do to prepare her family for the nights of Qadr. Mm -hmm. She would tell them to sleep during the day. She would ensure that for suhoor they had a good, fulfilling uh, suhoor and, um, and that they got enough sleep during the day and she would prepare them and tell them, listen, make sure that you eat well and that you drink enough water and that you sleep well because we're going to be up together, this is a very important night. You know, the, the nights of Qadr are, and if we just look at the word Qadr, Qadr means mm -hmm. value. It actually means value. Um, so recognizing the, the value of this night is extremely important. Making them understand the value of this night. What happens in this night? That in these nights, um, everything is going to be set for this upcoming year. You know, 
تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر الله says in the chapter of قد he says the angels and the ruh this beautiful being that Allah has created from sheer light that extends from the earth all the way to the heavens that Allah uses to support Prophet Muhammad and the infallibles of Ahl al-Bayt that will descend upon the Imam al-Hujjah the Imam of the time and he will tell him of everything that we did in the last year and that's when our fates will be decided as well for the upcoming year what predestined things will be written for us this upcoming year right making them understand the value of that night making them understand that even these predestined things once they're written right now you have the ability to change them you connect with your near of kin you give charity on this night you pray as many rak as of, as you pray sheikh al-mufid is narrated to have said uh, one of our great maraja that there's nothing better than spending the nights of Qadr in gaining knowledge. Mm. Gaining knowledge that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That making them understand that it's not just about quantity. Oh, I want to finish a hundred rak'ahs. Oh, I want to finish. It's about quality, right? Quality, quality, quality. It's one night. The value of that night or the last ten nights, let's say, or the, you know, the three nights of of the major three nights of Qadr. Whatever you choose, whether you, the, the narrations say that Ahl al-Bayt would do Ihya of the last 10. Why, Imam Ja'far Sadiq would say, is it too little to ask that you spend the 10 last nights in hopes that one of them will truly allow you to enter heaven? Think about the yeah. five days of the year, right? Hmm. Notice how the Imam explains to us the value of that night. Can I sit and share these narrations with them? Can I make them understand that, you know, understanding the value of this night, understanding the importance of the Quran, connecting them to the Imam al Hujjah in that night? Think about where the Imam is at this point. What's descending upon him? How he's seeing everything that we've done? How he's literally setting what's going to happen to me in the upcoming year have i connected with the imam can i say that now my let's say quote unquote my new year's resolution after this new after i'm reborn after this mm -hmm. ramadan prophet muhammad says that only shaqi only the deviant one comes out of this holy month with sins right that means every single one of us will come out of the month of Ramadan, exactly as though we were firstborn. You know, Sheikh, I um, as we wrap up this this discussion, there's there's three words that everybody affiliates with the holy month of Ramadan: blessings, mercy, and forgiveness. And a lot of what you said attested to all all three of all all three of those aspects. And in the Holy Quran, it says, "O oh people, the month of Allah." has come towards you bringing divine blessings, mercy, and forgiveness. And I think everything that you said, it really reiterates this statement because, you know, it's not one part of the month. It's not one day of the month. It's not the beginning nor the end. It this The emphasis in this ayah is multiple forms. So from day one right and through the end, this mercy, blessing, and forgiveness is always there. So we should never feel that at any one stage, we're going to be losing out every single um, minute and every single day of this month is an opportunity to, to reap those three things. Yes? Asante, that's very true. And, you know, if we want really action items for this month, there's no better place to get the action items than the Holy Prophet himself. Reading that last sermon of the month of Sha'ban and welcoming the holy month of Ramadan, the Prophet gives us action items. He says, you need to purify your heart, clear your intention, make sure that you have true intentions to Allah, that, and make dua that he will make you successful in fasting this holy month and in reciting the holy Quran. Notice how many things he mentions just those two sentences and then he mentions dignify your elderly take care of your orphans take make sure you pay charity and so on and so on you if we want action items really um you know for someone who has experience in project management 
Before you start the project, you always write down a list of the things that you want to achieve. What are your goals? What are your objectives, right? How are you going to achieve them? Well, before you know how to achieve them, you need to know what they are. So the Prophet Sallallahu tells us what these things are, right? Make these, I would advise the parents, may Allah bless them, inshallah, is you can do a, a Google search, you'll find the sermon online. I'm sure Ja'fari Academy can also make it available to you. The Radiance podcast can make it available to you, where you can go item per item, right? Choose whichever ones. They're all very doable. Charity every day, very doable, right? Uh, sponsoring an orphan in this month. I and the sponsor of an orphan are as close as these two fingers, right? Um, I and the sponsor of an orphan will be in heaven, right? The Prophet says, he who takes care of an orphan in this month, um, and he uses the word that he who has that sense of kindness and care and, and um, wants to take care of the orphans, in this month, he says, uh, Be sure to treat orphans with kindness, search for them and see what their needs are and provide them their needs so that one day, if you have orphans, that others will also treat your orphans the same. Right? I ask that Allah Taala allows us to be able to take those action items, be able to achieve them and make those our children aware of these action items so that it becomes part of our monthly routine. Inshallah. Sheikh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for your inspirational words. I think there is a lot of guidance that you're able to put forward and inshallah our viewers are able to certainly, certainly benefit from them. Um, and on behalf of the Radiance Podcast of the Jeffrey Academy, we want to wish you and your family a most blessed month of Maha Ramadan. And inshallah, you and your children and your wife and your family members, may you reap the rewards of this month, inshallah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was honored to, to share this time with you and with your wonderful audience. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this holy month a successful one for all of you. You will all be in my dua. I ask that you remember me in your dua as well. Inshallah, we most definitely do. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone at the Jaffrey Academy. We wish you, inshallah, the most blessed Ramadan. Thank you. And thank you very much for everybody for listening in this evening. And inshallah, you may um, tune into this podcast and reap the rewards and the inspiration from Sheikh's words. Have a most wonderful, blessed month Ramadan ahead. And we wish you, Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.